Calaroga Shark Media. With all other problems in the world solved, a debate broke out on Good Morning Britain about whether audiences should be allowed to take a toilet break during a comedy show or not. Hi, I'm Johnny Mack with your daily comedy news. Comedian Kane Brown said getting up to use the toilet distracts others. Broadcaster Anna Mae Mangan said it's a human right. This debate comes after Frankie Boyle told venue staff not to allow people back into a show if they go to the bathroom after his act has started. Kane Brown, the comedian, said, I agree. I'm with Frankie. It's really disruptive. As a comedian, the one thing we require is attention. That's all we ask. Your attention will do the rest. Getting up to use the toilet or using your phone distracts other people and it distracts us on stage. Well, I agree about the phone, but come on. I might have to go to the bathroom. What do you want? Anna May, the TV host, said it's up to the comedian to make the audience pay attention and suggested if the folks are going to the loo, maybe they're bored. It's a human right to go to the toilet. You're not doing Hamlet, are you? You're getting heckled, I assume, and you're heckling back. Why can't people use the toilet? Kane, the comedian, said, It's usually the people in the middle row, and they have to excuse themselves. They have to go stand up. They're rubbing their nether regions on the back of people's necks. It's distracting. And the host said, If you go to a common space to see a comedian or any show, you have to understand. There are people on either side of you that might need something. The comedian said, You don't respect the art form of comedy. If you have a problem with your bladder, sit in the back or on an aisle. What do you think? Let me know on the Facebook group, Daily Comedy News Podcast group. Bill Burr was talking about the current comedy scene and uh, what he's seeing at the clubs. And he said, in one corner, the hipsters in skinny jeans and Buddy Holly glasses are playing in a room of people who look just like them. In the other corner, the hardworking club comics slung punchlines in front of a brick wall, working the room and taking on the hecklers. Bill Burr was in the latter group, and by 2012, he'd had enough of the nerds who condescended on the regular folks who told good old-fashioned jokes. Burr on his podcast said, I really can't wait for the backlash on nerds. I've had it with them, embracing the fact that they're awkward to the point of pretending to be awkward even when you're not. The alternative comedy scene is like the hair metal scene in late 1989. We're about a year away before Nevermind's going to come out and they're all going to be scurrying. I can't effing wait. He finds the alt scene homogenized. That's what I don't like about it, okay? No heckling, no drugs, no obnoxious behavior, no aggressiveness. The alt scene eliminated every reason it takes uh, cojones to be a comedian. Every reason people want to be a comic but never effing did it. You're removed from that situation. They've just created this bleeping comedy womb. It's like a radio station. It's not even a crowd. It's like an effing radio station. I only perform to hipsters age 18 to 24 wear skinny, loose jeans and have black framed glasses. When their jokes don't go over, they act like the crowd is dumb. He compared alt comics to specialists like long snappers on a football team. You can only play one effing position and you turn around, you blame the crowd. Burr's fed up with the amount of shots over the effing years that they've taken up a club comics like we're all a bunch of hacks talking about airplane food like they're above us. Then you go do some benefit or some comedy festival. They put club comics and all comics together. And what happens? All the all comics go on early. That's who gets to mop up in the end. Two hours on the effing show, a club comic. Just for the record, the alt scene was started by club comics. All those guys, David Cross, Bob Odenkirk, Dana Gould, Mark Maron, Beast, all of them. They could perform in off-track betting and they could have a great set. But he says that first wave has created a generation of comedy Nepo babies. They're almost like rich kids who have kids. They struggled up through all this stuff, and then they just have these kids, and their first car is like a Maserati. They wrap it around a pole, and there's no ramifications. Love it. <laughs> Larry David was on Rick Eisen's show. Apparently, Larry David doesn't like kicking in football. Told Rick Eyes, and you know about the UFL that's starting up. It's a spring football league. And you know how I feel about the goalposts, right? I thought, let me talk to somebody in the UFL. I mean, it's insane. So my agent got me on the phone with Dwayne Johnson. Johnson is the uh, face of the UFL. I think he's a major investor. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Why doesn't he like kicking? Suppose there was a baseball game and there were two parallel bars in deep center field that were 12 feet apart. And you could get a guy off the bench to hit a fungo. And if you got it through the bars, you get a run. I mean, what's the point? It's nothing to do with the game. I kind of like that idea better than the ghost runners. Nick Swartzen describes a stand-up comedy as it's like crack. But instead of a pipe, you have a mic. I've never done crack. But I, what I've done with stand-up, there's a solid fallback plan. Film is way different than stand-up. You have to work on a script, go into pre-production, film, edit, market, and then see how it goes. It could take over a year. Stand-up is immediate. I can write a joke, go on stage that night, and see if they hate it. Film, I have to wait for a year to critics to tell me to F off. <laughs> Brad Williams spoke to Nouveau.net about being a father, and they were curious about the difference between being a father and being a comedian. Uh, Brad said, it's two different characters. When I'm on the road doing theaters, it's rock star life. There are thousands of people who are excited to see you. There's cheering. There are people who want to meet you. There's everybody at the theater who's like, whatever you need. Then you get home and no one gives a hoot that you just sold thousands of tickets and made a lot of money. 
All it is is getting up, making breakfast for the kid, walking her to school and doing stuff during the day. The wife doesn't care. The kid doesn't care. Nobody cares. I don't know if I'm balancing family and work correctly. The people on my work side would say I'm doing too much family and my family would probably say I'm doing too much work, which means I'm probably doing it right if both sides are unhappy. TJ Miller was on the Loud Wire at Nights podcast. TJ said, I listen to rock albums growing up, but I also listen to stand-up comedy albums. I listen to Steve Martin's A Wild and Crazy Guy, and Comedy's Not Pretty. Bob Newhart, I listen to Lenny Bruce, even Richard Pryor, George Carlin, all those guys were so amazing. I love a room full of strangers all getting together and laughing and really enjoying something that they can all equally love. Steph Tolev told WPR one of her big influences was Kids in the Hall. I like Goofy. When I think comedy can be so over the top, it becomes funnier to me. Her current tour is called Filth Queen, and she said, Somebody really worded my comedy very well. She's like, you're so gross, but you're so goofy that it makes it not as gross. Also, I am gross. I think like this. It's not like I'm trying to be gross. I'm a very open person. I'm very sexual. I talk about that stuff very openly, and I think people do too, but they just like to say that they don't. A couple things for you to check out my Substack. That's uh, where I write my media thoughts. The link is in the show notes, but it's mcdpod.substack.com. It might ask you for a donation. I'm not looking to charge people for that. But uh, the way Substack works is I have to have such an option out there. Otherwise, the whole back end doesn't work. But just blow through that and be like, nope, I want it for free. Uh, so that's the Substack. Link in the notes, mcdpod.substack.com. Also, you can join the $2 Club. What you do is you go to buymeacoffee.com slash dailycomedynews. You join the $2 Club. And then every month, your credit card will get hit and you'll donate $2 to this show. And then like 20 years from now, you'll be like, wait, I've been donating for 20 years and I'll be on my yacht somewhere. So appreciate that. The Melbourne Comedy Festival continues. Oh, so tomorrow uh, I did a special episode. Tomorrow is a deep dive on up and coming Aussie comics. So tomorrow is me going, hey, here's somebody and a clip and here's somebody else you haven't heard of and a clip. So it, it's uh, clearly a pre-tape to accommodate Easter. But I think it came out really well. So if you want to get turned on to some new folks, that's tomorrow. And the Melbourne Comedy Festival continues. Now, since tomorrow's already in the can, I'll do two days worth here. And as I've mentioned, because of the way time zones work, I have to stay a day in advance. So uh, Sunday, uh, March 31 in Australia... I like this show title, 101 Ways to Annoy Your Parents and Other Really Old People. The Amazing Drumming Monkeys, the show for little kids. I'm curious. I'm clicking. Widely touted as Australia's favorite little kids puppet show. The monkeys have performed at festivals and events all over the world. Uh, it's it's monkeys drumming. Looks like the kind of thing you'd see over by uh, the Toucan Show at Disney World. You know what I'm talking about? It's like that. Or like a thing you'd see at Chuck E. Cheese. But it's drumming monkeys. Why not? A lot of kids shows uh, tomorrow. Bubble show in space. After completely selling out their Melbourne run in 2023, Dr. Bubble and Milkshake return with their most amazing bubble adventure yet. Milkshake wants a star from space, so she and Dr. Bubble travel to outer space in a bubble rocket that launches to the sky to see if they can get her one. Perth Happenings gave it five stars. Fart to the future. Farts are not my thing, but I clicked on this. Fart to the future. Jed and Jamie's friend Doc Hockenbottom are lost in time, and the only way to rescue him is to use the farts of famous historical figures to travel through time. Suitable for audiences 6 through 12 and 54 years old, apparently. All right, let me get out of the kids section and scroll down here and find some stuff for adults. Michael Chamberlain's completely incomplete history of Australian rules football. The Adelaide advertiser says, Entertaining intelligent. This guy is funny. <laughs> These little reviews. Best of British... Um, so, like, I'm not going to go to Australia to see Best of British, but I guess if I lived in Melbourne, that would be cool, right? Yes. Boats and Bogans. Bogan, one of my uh, favorite words that I discovered last year. I wasn't familiar with it. There will be stories and there will be stomach hurting, gut spewing, pants peeing. The Adelaide show gave it four stars, saying great snapshot of Adelaide's comedy scene. There's some actual stand-up with a clip. Cecilia Pacuola's I'm as surprised as you are. Let's listen. One day, I got up in the morning and one of my flatmates was in the kitchen making breakfast and, and I went, morning, and she went, mate. I went, yeah? And she goes, I've got to tell you, I heard you having sex last night. And I was like, well, great. This is embarrassing because I was not having sex. <laughs> last night. Not even a little bit. She goes, yeah, I figured it out. What had happened was 
She has a tiny dog, right? A Chihuahua cross Papillon. Its head is smaller than my fist, okay? It sleeps in her room with her. Somehow it got stuck outside her bedroom door. So it was crying and scratching at her bedroom door. And she heard that sound of a tiny dog crying and scratching and went, that'll be Celia. Bleeping, bleeping. I had to clip it there. She dropped an F-bomb, but the punchline there was, uh, you know, doing the stuff. Whew, it was close. Very funny clip. Like her. Kirsty Weeback, I'll be the judge of that, also has a clip for us. Let's check this out. Hello. Hello, besties. I'm, a, I'm not one of those comedians who singles out people in the audience and sort of has a chat to them. You know, we've all been to one of those shows before where the comedian's gotten up on stage and they've been like, what do you do? And we're like, oh, no, I wish I did something better, you know. And then they just rinse them for 10 minutes in front of their Tinder date. Like... I don't, I don't really do it, like no shade on other comedians, but I think it's a little bit cheeky, you know? We're like, buy a ticket, come and support my career, watch my show. Oh no, you are the show, you know? <laughs> but we are, we're one of the few modes of entertainment that does it. And I actually went to the ballet recently, because I'm a real culture vulture. <laughs> that is not true. I went to the ballet because I was tricked into it by a mate. And this is how she tricked me. She suggested we attend the ballet in the fun voice. You might be aware of the fun voice. It's a little bit quicker. It's a little bit higher pitched. We should go to the ballet. (laughs) It gets me every time. I was like, hell yeah, let's go to the ballet. A couple of days later, I was looking at my bank account and I was like, why are we going to the ballet? All right. Again, I want to remind everybody when I pull these clips, I'm basically pulling the first minute and, uh, you know, she may be building into something there. I don't know. Boy, there's like... 70 more shows if I scroll down, uh, but I got to do two days worth here. So let's see who's playing on Monday, April 1st in Melbourne, Australia, at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, March 27th through April 21st. Barry Potter and the Magic of Wizardry. All right, what's this? Experience the wonder of world-class wizardry in the realm of messenger owls, robe wizards, and flying broomsticks. Not sure what's going on there, but it's fun. At the Basement Comedy Club, Ben Knight and Friends Educators, uh, their logo is a chalkboard with educators who are none of that caught my eye. Ever wondered what teachers think about you and your kids? Join Ben Knight as he hosts a lineup show of educators who have since become stand-up comedians. That's fun. Hmm. Weird Al Piano Bar. What's this? Come worship at the Shrine of Yankovic with Milburn's Silly Sing Along. Weird Al Piano Bar venerates the undisputed king of the pop parody song Weird Al. With lyrics projected on the screen, here's your chance to sing, shout, and praise his holy name. No actual Weird Al, it's just Weird Al karaoke. All right, this podcast is going to be endlessly long if I keep going here, so let me get to more news. Rachel Senat, she's been the it girl lately in the movies. She's getting a show on HBO, a pilot anyway. In Untitled Project, a codependent friend group reunites, navigating how the time apart, ambition, and new relationships have changed them. Ari Spears wants to make it clear that he has nothing against LeBron James. He said to me, LeBron's in my top five. Do I think he's better than Michael Jordan? No. I don't give an F if he scores 80,000 points. He's been in the league since preschool. As popular as LeBron is, is he globally famous, like on the level of Jordan? No. Has he impacted the game of the love of Jordan? No. He also noted how Michael Jordan revolutionized the sponsorship part of basketball with Air Jordan sneakers. And that's your comedy news for today. If you enjoy the program, tell a friend about it. They might like it too. Tomorrow's episode is pretty cool. Hope you enjoy it. Would love some feedback on it on the uh, Daily Comedy News Podcast group. Happy Easter. See you tomorrow and Monday.